thanks for the introduction, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to come to such a focused meeting with so many experts on randomized numerical linear algebra. This is joint work with uh, Ben Erickson, Michael, and uh, Xu Sun Wang. Uh, so before getting into Rand in LA, I want to make some general background remarks about bootstrap methods, since uh, this will help to kind of orient the, the perspective that I want to take here, which is quite different from a traditional statistical perspective. So ordinarily in statistics, we think of the bootstrap as a general approach to do inference on randomness in data. And it's ordinarily thought of as being something that's computationally intensive. In fact, sometimes computationally intensive methods is used synonymously with bootstrap methods. Uh, by contrast, here, I want to use the bootstrap to do inference on randomness in an algorithm. I'll treat the input to the algorithm as, as fixed. And uh, also, I will want to use the bootstrap to enhance computation. So it's almost reversing the, the conventional uh, way of thinking about bootstrap methods. All right, so if you had to describe what bootstrap methods do in a sentence, a reasonable uh, way of doing that would just be to say there, it's a general approach to estimating standard deviations and quantiles of statistics. There's a lot more that it can do, but that's a, that's a good first pass. And when the bootstrap really shines is, is in problems that are too complicated to analyze by direct analytical means. So if, if you can't get an asymptotic formula for the standard deviation of a statistic, the bootstrap allows you to completely bypass that difficulty and rely on computation instead. Uh, surprisingly, though, even in some situations when you can work out a formula, the bootstrap can even do better in certain cases. Uh, there's an extensive literature on this topic. It's been around uh, since the seminal paper of Efron in 1979. Uh, really huge amount of work. Uh, but outside of traditional statistical applications, I think there are still a lot of opportunities to apply the bootstrap in new ways, and hopefully this talk will kind of illustrate that for this community. I think you know, in, in computation, using the bootstrap in the service of computation is, is largely unexplored. OK, so just to give a concrete example of how the bootstrap is typically used, uh, let's consider a situation where we have some generic estimate theta hat of an unknown parameter theta. And we obtain theta hat by applying some generic function psi to a data set consisting of IID observations. So this is just kind of a vanilla statistical situation. And something we might like to do is to approximate the 90% quantile of this error variable. So that's the absolute difference between theta hat and theta. And by definition, the 90% quantile is just the tightest bound of this form that holds with 90% probability. And you could tune that probability to be whatever, you, whatever else you wanted. And in essence, what the bootstrap tries to do is it tries to sort of uh, proceed in a, you could think of it as in a parallel universe where we are generating fresh data sets in a parallel universe from a distribution that is not quite the same as the one that generated the original data. And in this parallel universe, our estimate from the real world is going to play the role of the true parameter. Okay, so the way that I'll generate the fake data in the parallel universe will be to sample new observations x1 star through x n star from the original set with replacement. Okay, that's the same thing as sampling IID from the empirical distribution on the original observations. Then I'll take the same function that I used originally and I'll apply that to the new observations. That'll give me a so-called bootstrap sample of my estimate. I'll denote that as theta hat j star for the jth iterate of this loop. Then I'll take the absolute difference between the bootstrap estimate and the original estimate. That will give me a bootstrap version of the error variable. Then when the loop's done, I'll take the 90% quantile of, of these numbers, and that will be my estimate. Well, so if you want to prove that it works, it does. And the analysis hinges very much on the smoothness, et cetera. So, Actually, this, is, this raises an important point. So this looks almost unbelievably simple, but let's also remember this wasn't invented until 1979. So the, the simplicity of this approach 
strongly belies the, the sophistication that goes into understanding it. All right, uh, now let's go into randomized numerical linear algebra. So the main question that I want to focus on is, how large is the error of a given solution? Right? So that's a very natural question we'd like to address. And uh, up to now, the, sort of the prevailing approach in the literature is to rely on, on theoretical guarantees that give us some uh, way of relating the computational cost to the accuracy of a, of a randomized solution. And these kinds of results give us a lot of insight into the factors that influence the performance of random LA algorithms, but there are inherent limitations of this kind of approach. So one is that these sorts of guarantees are typically formulated from a worst case perspective. So for any particular problem, uh, the results may be pessimistic. These kinds of results often involve constants, which may or may not uh, depend on unknown parameters. Even if you can give an explicit constant, it, it may be conservative. Uh, and likewise, these kinds of results may or may not account for all of the structure that may be unique to your particular problem. So these issues make it difficult to apply theoretical results to, to get an explicit numerical error bound uh, for a particular solution. And this motivates a quite alternative approach, which often goes by the name of a posteriori error estimation. The a, poster, a posteriori here doesn't refer to Bayesian statistics. It just refers to the fact that the error is being estimated after the solution has already been computed. And in some areas of applied math, this is actually a very well-developed topic, especially in areas like numerical PDEs and finite element methods. There are, in fact, entire books devoted precisely to this topic. However, I would say in the context of RAND in LA, in proportion to the amount of work that's been done over the last decade or so, the number of papers that actually try to address uh, error estimation in a serious way is actually quite small. This is, this is almost a, com a comprehensive list of references. Not quite, but there's just not very many papers that have tried to estimate the error at all. Um, and in this talk, I want to uh, describe this uh, problem in the context of matrix multiplication least squares. This is by no means the only uh, set of situations where you could try to do this, but hopefully it will give some indication of what is possible. All right, so I'll, I'll break the talk up into two parts. Uh, the first part will be on matrix multiplication. And the material will come from two papers. One appeared this year at JMLR. The other was recently posted to archive. The main difference between these two papers that w is that one focuses on uh, error as measured in the maximum entry-wise norm, or in other words, the entry-wise L-infinity norm on matrices. And the more recent one focuses on spectral norm error. So, uh, and for those of you who may have seen this talk before, there will be, there will be some new stuff. OK, so just to give you the, the sort, sort of the notation for randomized matrix multiplication, I assume most of you are quite familiar with this. I'll be dealing with two very tall matrices, A and B, with N rows and D columns. So N is much larger than D. And ideally, I'd like to compute A transpose B, but it's too expensive, and so I'm going to use sketches. So that I'll use T to denote the sketch size, which we think of as being between the small dimension D and the large dimension N. And I'll take the sketches A tilde and B tilde and multiply those together to form an approximation to the true product. All right. So for the purposes of developing a bootstrap method, the particularities of the sketching matrix are not so crucial. Really, the only properties that I'll need the sketching matrix to satisfy are that its expected gram matrix is the identity and that the rows are essentially independent. So th these are more or less standard conditions for pretty much any uh, typical sketching matrix. All right, so now let's take a look at how the error variable behaves as a function of the sketch size. So let me first address the plot on the left. So the way this plot was generated was by incrementally increasing the sketch size one at a time. And each time I increase the sketch size, I compute the exact error uh, for that particular sketch. So this is not something you can plot in practice. This is just to illustrate uh, how this variable behaves as a function of the sketch size t. And as you would expect, the error comes down, but it fluctuates quite a bit. And one sample path does not give you an accurate picture 
of all the fluctuations, and that's what's shown on the right. So if I generated many independent copies of this sample path, that's what's shown on the right. And basically, the, the interpretation is if I fix the sketch size of, say, 400, your actual error could really be anywhere in this range. Okay? And in practice, you wouldn't know that. Uh, and so that motivates a way of formulating error estimation in terms of the quantile of these, or the quantile curve of these sample paths. All right, so that's how I'll try and, and talk about error estimation. So I'll define Q of t to be the 1 minus alpha quantile of the error variable at any sketch size. So in, the, in this plot, the 99% quantile curve is the thick black curve such that 99% of the sample paths lie below it. And uh, this, is, this curve is something the user would really like to know in practice, because if they knew it, there's at least two things they could do with it. One is, for any sketch size, they'd know how accurate this, the sketch product is likely to be. And secondly, you could use this in a predictive way, where if there's some target accuracy you ultimately want to achieve, this curve will tell you how far out you need to go to get there. All right. So, so this quantile curve is, is my target for estimation. So you could think of this curve as like an unknown parameter, and the sketches will be like my data, and I'll try and use that data to estimate the curve. Uh, but there's some caveats or restrictions that we have to deal with in the context of RAND in LA. So one is I don't want to run the sketching algorithm many, many times. I only want to run it, say, once or twice. And that m may almost make it seem like this, this problem is too hard to solve. Right? The quantile curve arises hypothetically from many repeated runs of the sketching algorithm. So how is it there's enough information in just a sketch of A and B to, to get at this curve? So it's maybe a little bit surprising that there's enough information. And in some sense, that's what makes the bootstrap so useful. Uh, there's another constraint we have to deal with, which is that we're computationally constrained. So whatever method I come up with should be inexpensive enough so that it does not outweigh the benefit of doing sketching in the first place. Uh, and again, it's important to remember, we don't get to see any of this in practice. So here is the, the proposal. I'll fix an integer j. That's the number of a bootstrap samples I'm going to generate. And then the only other inputs are the sketches a and b. This algorithm never needs to touch the original, the original input matrices. So, so we proceed in a loop. Uh, the first step involves forming a matrix a tilde star of the same size as a tilde just by sampling the rows of a tilde with replacement. Then I'll do the same thing with respect to b tilde. I'll sample its rows with replacement. That'll give me a new matrix B tilde star. Then I'll take the difference between the starred product and the unstarred one, evaluate my norm of choice on that, and that will give me a bootstrap version of the error variable. Then when the loop's done, I'll collect these bootstrapped error variables and take the desired quantile. So maybe I should pause here for a minute in case there are any questions about the algorithm. So how do you choose capital J? As large you, as you can afford. It, in essence, this procedure is like simulating from an approximate distribution. So you'd like to, so what, whatever you can afford. But the good news is that in practice, taking J to be a few dozen is usually quite adequate. So A should have, A and B should have J rows, right? No. no T. T? The, the A tilde star and the B tilde star are the same size as the original sketches. Think of them as perturbations of the original sketches. Yeah. So I didn't. So the reason I didn't index these is because after each iteration, you can throw those away. You don't have to store them. Okay. What's other, T? What's that? How is T related to other things? So, so I'll get at this. So let's just say you have some initial sketch size, uh, but that's it. I'll get there in in one second actually. Yes. But it seems like you're. Is this going to be useful if you don't see? a large portion of A in some sense in your original sketch? Before. Right, so this, this will actually be a little bit surprising. You don't actually need uh, a large initial sketch size. But I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Yes? <laughs> Why are you not um, bootstrapping on the sketches themselves? So That's what I am doing. Oh, that is what I mean, I you, you fixed, I thought you fixed A tilde and B. Those, so A tilde and B tilde, those are my inputs to the, to the bootstrap algorithm. 
why why aren't you bootstrapping the bootstrap? Uh, you could, but I don't want to do that. That would oh, be more know. work. No. So, th so from a if you're familiar with thinking about the bootstraps from a statistical point of view, think of the A tilde and, your, and the B tilde as data matrices. The rows of those are observations, and I'm bootstrapping those observations. And there's no assumption that those rows are coming from some so, so, so for the analysis, there are some conditions, and, and I'll get there. Yeah. Any other? I'm happy to clarify, because I think uh, making the bootstrap useful in RAND in LA uh, Part of the challenge is, is, is communicating, so I'm happy to clarify anything. All right, so now to get to the issue of the sketch size. So think of what I just introduced as, a, as like a basic version of the bootstrap. One way I can enhance it is to use a, a basic extrapolation technique. So the CLT tells me that the fluctuations of the quantile curve, or I'm sorry, the quantile curve should decay like 1 over square root of t of the sketch size. So the fluctuations of the air variable are like 1 over square root of t. Okay, that just ha comes from the fact that you can write the difference of the sketch product and the true product as a sample average of independent centered rank 1 matrices. All right, so this scaling property is, is, is simple, but it's crucial because what it allows you to do is con to consider a small initial sketch size, say, think, think of somewhere in here, you run the bootstrap here, that gives you a number like this. So t naught is the small sketch size. Then I want to form an extrapolated estimate that will agree with the initial estimate, say here, and then get the rest for free. So uh, the curve that, that does that is this. So when t equals t naught, these, these two things agree. And then thereafter, you just get a 1 over square root of t uh, extension. And as simple as that rule might seem, it works surprisingly well uh, in a surprisingly broad range of conditions. All right, so what about cost? Uh, so the, a natural point of reference is to look at the cost of ordinary sketching for matrix multiplication. And that cost looks something like this. So there's two terms. There's the cost of doing ordinary matrix multiplication on a full sketch size, say t, that's larger than the t naught. And then there's the other cost of forming the sketches themselves. And uh, in comparison, the cost of applying the extrapolated bootstrap to these looks something like this. So j is the number of bootstrap samples, t naught is the small initial sketch size, and d squared is, is the square of the dimension. And an important point to emphasize is that this cost does not depend on the large dimension n, whereas the ordinary cost of sketching grows linearly with it. Right? Um, and the condition you want to satisfy is that the cost of bootstrapping should not be of larger order than the original cost of sketching. And that happens when the number of bootstrap samples satisfies this condition. Something I, I didn't mention here, which is important, is that the bootstrap samples can be computed in an embarrassingly parallel way. So arguably, you could just divide that cost by the number of processors you have. Furthermore, the cost of, of distributing everything is cheap because you're only working with tiny initial sketches. Um, all right. And maybe one other thing I should clarify is that the initial sketches do not have to give you a good product. They can actually give you a very poor product, and that's fine because I'm only interested in estimating the error. All right. And uh, again, I think I mentioned this a minute ago, but the, the, the number of bootstrap samples can be taken quite small in practice. Usually a few dozen is, is good enough. So here's the, the main result. Um, let's consider sketching error in the spectral norm. And I'll consider one structural assumption on the input matrix, which is that the singular values have a decay profile. So the i singular value scales like i to the minus beta. These are the non-zero singular values. Um, this condition allows for repeated singular values, so you don't have to have gaps between all of them. Uh, the decay parameter needs to be at least or greater than a half. So if you think of A transpose A as like an operator, this condition basically means that that operator needs to have summable eigenvalues. Uh, and then with regard to the sketching matrix, I'll take it to have suitably centered and scaled IID sub-Gaussian entries. That's stronger than what you apparently need in practice, but it makes the theory uh, doable. So here's the result. So under these conditions, you get a bound of this form. So this bound takes some interpretation. So what I'm comparing here 
is the conditional distribution of a bootstrap sample for your given sketch. And I'm comparing that with the actual distribution of the true air variable. And I'm comparing those two distributions in a uniform sense with respect to their CDFs. Uh, you might ask, well, why is this what I'm interested in, I, given that I was talking about the quantile earlier? And basically, if you have a bound on this thing, you can easily turn that into a guarantee on the quantiles. I won't go into that. But this is just a, a very conventional statistical measure of distance. And now let's look at the right side. So the, the uh, very nice property of the right side is that it's dimension free with respect to the input matrix A. The right side is only a function of the sketch size. And the reason for that dimension free property is because I'm a, making a, a scaling assumption on the singular values. Um, Sorry, could you, could you make the exponent of the t on the right side? It's a little hard to read. It's yeah, so I'll, yeah, I'll tell you what it is. So it's, it's minus the fraction beta minus 1 half over 6 beta plus 4. And you, you could wonder, well, how does that beta minus a half get in there? It's a little bit uh, subtle. I have some. Uh, informal remarks in the paper d explaining why that seems to be necessary, but that's a little bit technical. Is that from the decay parameter for the singular values? That's yeah, so that beta, beta is the same as this beta. Mm -hmm. And in particular, what this dependence shows is that as the decay gets faster, the performance of the bootstrap gets better and better, which is intuitive because if the, if the singular values are decaying very quickly, then the problem is becoming effectively of smaller and smaller dimension. The lower the rank, the better the bootstrap because there's that's more right. redundancy. That's right. That's right. Any other questions? So if you compare that to, I guess, I guess, uh, the the size of the sketch that you need to get the appropriate error, right? You said that, you know, that should be you should be able to get away with smaller bootstrap right. size. Right. Right. So how does it compare? So this, I mean, oops. So this is, I mean, to some extent, this is a large, large sample result. Uh, trying to analyze the performance of the bootstrap at, at relatively small sketch sizes, that's a delicate question. I mean, to some extent, to address that properly, you'd have to get into like higher order expansions, which is interesting. In fact, there's been quite a bit of work on that sort of thing in connection with the bootstrap. There's a book by someone named Peter Hall specifically on that kind of thing, but uh, that's sort of well beyond the scope of this talk. But can you make a claim that, uh, you know, I, I can actually, I mean, that the result is meaningful in the sense that I get a, you know, some kind of an estimate of that quantile that is uh, sort of uh, more accurate than, than just the, the general error guarantee that I get for the whole sketch? So, so you, in other words, you want to, uh, you want to quantify the performance of the extrapolated estimate as compared to just running the bootstrap at a given sketch size? I guess I'm just trying to somehow understand how you can, I mean, how this theorem would imply in, in some, however, special sense that, uh, that, that you can uh, use a bootstrap size that's significantly, like the, the t is significantly smaller than the size of the actual Oh, sketch. right. Uh, so in other words, why, why can you get away with, with a smaller sketch size for error estimation than you could to get an accurate product? Right. I see. Uh, that's a little bit mysterious, actually. I don't, I don't fully understand that. And uh, it's, it's fortunate. Is how, how does that, is, is, this, is this the right conclusion from this theorem? That you can get away with a smaller bootstrap size? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily infer that. I mean, for, first of all, you have to remember the thing I'm bounding here is a, is a metric on distribution. So it's a quite different thing than bounding the operator norm error between uh, the sketch product and the true. And these, are, these two things are kind of living in different worlds to some extent. But, but I agree. It's, 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 it is surprising to me, actually, that uh, the number of the sketch size you need to get a good error estimate is typically much lower than the sketch size you need in order to get an accurate approximation of the product. I, that's, that's a good question. Also the number J, capital J of bootstrap. Ah, OK, so, so this is a common sleight of hand that's used in stating statistical results. So this, refer, this essentially refers to t 
having taking an infinite number of bootstrap samples. There's a way you could there's a simple there's some simple results you can use to account for that. There's something called the Dvoretsky Kiefer Wolfowitz theorem that will allow you to get basically a one over square root of the number of bootstrap samples, but it's a relatively small point. But that's a it's a legitimate detail. Okay, yeah. Uh, in, but empirically, the number of bootstrap samples is also, you can take it to be surprisingly small. All right, so I should, I should probably move along. I only have about 10 minutes left. Uh, there's some, there's some in interesting intermediate results that mi might be of interest to some people in this room regarding uh, covariance estimates, but uh, I won't get into that here. Uh, I'll say one word about the, the previous results. So, in the earlier paper, we were looking at uh, the entry-wise L infinity norm for the air variable. And the results there are a little bit more general. So this is a weaker norm than the spectral or operator norm. And that allows some of the conditions in the newer result to be relaxed. So in, in the previous paper, we considered a wider range of sketching matrices. And there's essentially no conditions required on the matrix A. The, the nature of the, the bound is different, so we're using a different statistical distance. And also, the, this bound is not dimension free. The rate's different. So it would take me some time to, to compare and contrast the results. But uh, I think those are the main points to, to mention. Let me give you some empirical results. So, so can I ask one more yes. Do you, have, uh, do you have operator two norm results for the product AB? Because uh, there you had, you had A, A transpose. Oh, right. I don't. Uh, I, b I believe that everything would go through, but the, the, proof, the proof to handle even just A transpose A is already super complicated. Uh, and the reason why it's complicated is because the operator norm of the difference between the random matrix and the true one, th think of it as like a, it's a supremum of a stochastic process indexed by the unit sphere. And that process has a very complicated covariance structure. It's a very complicated random variable. So uh, I wish I had time to get into that, but I don't. So, um, so yes? So you condition on S, but what size does S have to be? Uh, S, is this, S is T by N. S is T by N. The number of oh, okay. outer products you pick is T. But T is not the number of times you no, J was, that was capital J. Sorry. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of indices. All right, so let me just quickly give some empirical results for matrix multiplication. So I have a synthetic 10,000 by 1,000 matrix A. Uh, I'll set the decay parameter on the singular values to be minus 3 fourths. And then to convince you that you don't need any gaps in the singular values, I'll set the first five uh, leading singular values all to be equal to 1. Uh, and then to convince you that I don't have to be clever about the singular vectors, I'll draw them uniformly at random. Uh, I'll consider Gaussian random projections or uniform sampling for the sketching matrices. These are kind of at opposite ends of the spe spectrum of sketching matrices you might consider. The number of bootstrap samples is only 50, and I'll extrapolate from an initial sketch size of 300. So here's the result. So the black curve, if you can see it, it corresponds to the true quantile curve. The blue curve corresponds to the average of, the, of applying the bootstrap at every individual sketch size. And the red curve corresponds to extrapolating only from here. Okay, so, there, so one thing is all the curves are right on top of each other, which is nice. Uh, it's hard to see from the lighting, but there's a pink envelope around the curves, uh, which corresponds to plus or minus one standard deviation. What that basically shows you is that the the fluctuations of the extrapolated estimate are actually quite well behaved. Uh, and I think the, the performance of the extrapolation is remarkable, right? I mean, the final sketch size I'm considering here is 2100, but I was extrapolating from 300. So you, you can extrapolate out by a factor of 7, and you're losing virtually nothing. Uh, that's in the case of the Gaussian random projection. If you do uniform sampling, the results are virtually uh, unchanged. So in particular, that sh that's giving you an indication that the bootstrap is relatively insensitive to the type of sketching matrix. Uh, I'll f just flash some results for, for the case of the entry-wise uh, L infinity norm. So here the matrix is 60,000 by about 800. The sketches are different. They're randomized Hadamard or length sampling. The number of bootstrap samples is 20. And the initial sketch size is only 400. That's really small compared to 60,000. 
and the nature of the plots is pretty much the same. In this case, the blue curve is the extrapolated estimate. The black is the true. Uh, it's, it's more or less the same story. So in the interest of time, I won't dwell on this. I've got about five minutes, so I'll, tr I'll try and, and quickly hit the main points for least squares. And this is, this is based on work that appeared last year at ICML. All right, so here's the setup. I'll consider an n by d matrix A of rank D. The number of rows is very large compared to the number of columns. And I'd like to be able to compute the exact least square solution, but it's too expensive. So I'll work with sketches. So again, I'll have the A tilde, and I'll have a vector B tilde in this case. Um, and here, I'll be dealing with two different kinds of sketching algorithms. So one is the sketch and solve, uh, or classic sketch algorithm. And th then another more recent proposal is the so-called iterative Hessian sketch algorithm, which is kind of akin to a, like a quasi-Newton method. One, this one is iterative. This one is one shot. So these are two algorithms have quite different characteristics. But what's nice is that the bootstrap can be successfully applied to either of these. So Whichever you prefer, you can still use the bootstrap to get error estimates. All right, so here's the problem formulation. It's more or less analogous to the, what I described in matrix multiplication. I have an error variable that's the norm of, a, of the difference between the sketch solution and the exact one. And then I'm interested in getting an estimate of the quantiles of these error variables for either algorithm. And then I have an extra index here that's k. That's the number of iterates for the, for the quantile in the case of the IHS algorithm. Uh, the intuition is, is pretty similar. You, in, the, in the case of least squares, the idea is that the, the, boots, the bootstrap, or, or I'm sorry, the, the sketch solution will play the role of the exact least square solution in this parallel bootstrap world. And then uh, I'll perturb the A tilde and the B tilde by resampling, and that will give me a new solution, X tilde star. So I'll only present the, algor the bootstrap algorithm for the sketch and solve. The case of the iterative Hessian sketch is similar. Uh, again, I have a loop, and the only inputs are the sketches. I don't need to touch the original uh, full inputs. So I'll draw a vector of indices with replacement from the set 1 through t. I'll take uh, those indices and plug them into my sketch to get a set of rows, and likewise for the entries of the b tilde vector. Then I'll solve the associated least squares problem of the a tilde star and the b tilde star. That will give me a bootstrap version of the error variable. Then when the loop's done, I'll collect the error variables and take the associated quantile. Um, one detail you might be interested in for the IHS algorithm, it's iterative, so you, it's not clear necessarily a priori if you should run the bootstrap after each iteration or not. And the good news is you only have to run it after the final iteration. You don't have to run it every iteration. Uh, to address computational cost, again, the cost of the bootstrap is independent of the large dimension n because it never needs to touch the inputs, the full inputs. In practice, again, the, the number of bootstrap samples can be taken to be a few dozen. The per processor cost looks something like this. If you're using an initial sketch size, say t naught, and again, you can make use of the fact that the bootstrap's embarrassingly parallel. Um, an extra benefit that you get in the least squares case is that you have free warm starts for the bootstrap computations. And the reason is that your original sketch serves as a warm start whenever you're solving the bootstrap version of the least squares problem. Uh, and then lastly, you can again use extrapolation. The form of the extrapolation rule is different for IHS, but it is also successful in practice. So here's some num numerical results. I have a matrix A that's about half a million rows and about 100 columns. And then I'm taking these initial sketch sizes, both very small compared to half a million. Uh, the black curve is the true quantile curve for uh, classic sketch, and the blue curve is the average of the bootstrap estimates with fluctuations around it. In the case of IHS, the, the error is plotted on the log scale, because it's an iterative algorithm. And the extrapolation rule I use here is linear, because the IHS algorithm is known to have a linear rate of convergence. In either case, you can see that the average of the estimates is agreeing quite well with the, with the true curve. So uh, that's all I'll say about this, except one more thing to mention is the number of bootstrap samples is only 20, so that's, that's pretty encouraging. Uh, let's see. So I have only a couple minutes left. 
The theoretical results in the least squares context are formulated a bit differently because least squares is a more complicated operation than matrix multiplication. Um, these results are formulated in an asymptotic way. So the lim inf of the probability that the quantile estimate is doing its job is lower bounded by the probability that you want. Um, and then there's an analogous result for IHS. So the way that the results are formulated is by holding the small dimension D fixed while the big dimension and the sketch size go to infinity. The sketching matrix here for theoretical purposes has IID entries. And in order for the asymptotics to make sense, I'll need uh, the gram matrix of A and this vector to be stable in a, in a certain sense. Uh, the most difficult part of the analysis actually deals with the IHS algorithm. And that's because you have to analyze the last iterate based upon all the previous random iterates. And there's a, a crucial ingredient that I think is worth highlighting. It may not be super well known, at least not in the multivariate case. This is something called Polya's theorem. So the scalar version of this result says the following. It says if you have a sequence of generic random variables that has a limit in distribution, and if the limiting random variable has a continuous distribution, then you get a bonus over usual convergence distribution. You get actually uniform convergence of the CDF. So th this, is a fr this is almost like a, at the level of an undergraduate exercise in real analysis. But what's really cool is the multivariate case. So in the multivariate case, the soup over the real line extends to a supremum over all convex subsets of Euclidean space. So it's kind of a massive uh, supremum. And this gives you this uniformity of the, of the limit is what allows you to handle um, the, the previous iterates in the context of IHS. Basically, you want to develop an approximation that holds uniformly over the past iterates. So now let me sum up. The bootstrap is a, is a very flexible approach to error estimation that can be adapted to a variety of randomized algorithms. It gives us a practical alternative to worst case analysis, and it automatically adapts to the inputs that you actually have. The cost does not outweigh the benefit of doing sketching in the first place. There's a lot of things that can be done to, to scale up the bootstrap. Uh, in particular, it does not require touching the full inputs. It can be parallelized, and it can be extrapolated. The numerical results are pretty encouraging, and they're supported by theoretical guarantees. So thanks for your attention. J is the number of times that you draw bootstrap samples. T is the number of samples or number of draws that make up each bootstrap sample. T is your sketch size. It's both. So think of it. Th think of this as a two stage. Think of this as a two stage process. I so you're resampling the same uh, sketch of the same size. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So there are concentration inequalities, right, for both problems. So how does the bootstrap compare to the concentration inequality? Should we just give up the concentration inequalities and just do bootstrap and get better? So concentration inequalities come in under the hood. Uh, but in essence, the, the main difference at a conceptual level is that to analyze the bootstrap, you're really trying to do a distributional approximation, right? Whereas concentration inequalities are are a different kind of result. They're saying that a random variable is close to something with high probability. But distribution level approximation is more fine grained, right? You want to know actually the, the shape of the, of the entire distribution. So as a user, which one should I use to get a better feeling for the error? Well, these are just, I'm not sure I understand, these are just theoretical techniques. They're both, they're both relevant. So concentration inequalities definitely come in in a big way under the hood. Uh, but the, but, but to get distributional approximation, there's some extra issues that come up as well. So you, you showed uh, using the bootstrap to analyze the error and the solution of the least squares problem. Um, of course, the error uh, solution may be quite sensitive depending on the conditioning of your matrix. You might prefer to understand if, uh, if your residual norm is close to the optimal residual norm. Is it even easier to get statistics? So, so in the case of least squares, uh, one benefit of doing an asymptotic analysis is that any norm is allowed. So you could do the norm associated with the A matrix. And that's, that would be allowed. In fact, we've done, I didn't show the results, but we've done that as well, and the results are good. All right. Well, let's thank Miles again and get David set up. So